Hello everyone, it's Michael Fisher um, from the Fearology Institute and uh, this video is a response to Michael Moore. It's a new film, Fahrenheit 11.9, and this is response number two because the first response I put on video, uh, you can take a look at that uh, on YouTube here, and then I also did a blog after that, after I'd seen the film, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so I wanted to say that uh, Michael Moore, again, I'm a fan of his, uh, to repeat that point, which I do in the first video. Um, there's some things in the second video that I want to bring in in terms of why I got some criticism that I did when I did that uh, review of Michael Moore, uh, his interview with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! Uh, so I'll respond to that and show you how I think so differently about, as a lot of my critics do, and just the general public, I think, in the way they understand fear and is fear a useful motivator and those kinds of questions. So that's, you know, really the core of the topic today. I will uh, show you some of my models of how I think uh, differently to organize uh, my critique and to justify my critique of Michael Moore's. And it could be many people I'm critiquing who use fear-based ideas, um, paradigm for justifying the use of fear as a motivator. All right, so I'm gonna swing uh, during this video to the whiteboard and uh, I'm going to do a few different things. I wanna read a small excerpt of, to help make my argument today, a small excerpt from a article I'm writing. That's probably gonna be a small monograph. Uh, it's called Western Scholarly Origins of Fearism as a Philosophy, and I'll be reading this little section from Introduction to the Philosophy of Fearlessness and Philosophy of Fearism and the Growing Problem, um, which I call, in this uh, context, the Growing Problem of Fear, or Fear Problem. All right, so let's uh, go to the whiteboard. Michael Moore's Meets Fearologist, this is number two, uh, creating a video. And I put number two because uh, if you get on to uh, look below this video, let's just get the text here. Um, I've created uh, a blog on the fearlessness movement, Ming. Put that up here. Um, and that's where we're all, there's a link to Michael Moore meets virologist number one. And I make an argument there of, I've watched the film um, by Michael Moore the other night with, with Barbara and I still have my same critique. So uh, nothing in the film changed. Um, if anything, uh, in that blog, you will be able to read um, a deeper critique that I have, especially so how he uses some of the imagery, particularly the last uh, uh, 15 seconds or so of the movie. All right, but that's not the topic uh, I'm gonna focus on per se is the movie, but just to let you know, again, I see Michael Moore as uh, a great, you know, populist activist um, today. And I've referred to him as a, you know, a really great artist for our time in many ways. And my basic critique has been not so good as an educator, and particularly around fear management education. Um, I've said, you know, since way back in 2002 or so, um, he's just not a very good educator. And that's a problem, and uh, maybe some of what I have to share today on the video uh, will be useful to improving how not only he, but perhaps, of course, others who are attempting to help deal with, you know, this fear problem. And, you know, how do we do education in all mediums? And right, that's like formal, uh, non-formal education, and some people even call it a-formal education. That's, uh, kind of the domain of interest today. And I'll just say my last critique in general of Michael Moore, again, 
could be a whole bunch of other people, X, Y, Z. Many other people could be involved in that. Um, just going to spread this out. He's not the only one. Is that uh, they uh, don't have a a good theory, and I, by that I mean praxis of fear and fearlessness work. And that's what I've spent, you know, the last three decades, as I've shared before in videos. Um, attempting to come up with a, a good praxis, which is really, you know, the theory and practice um, meet each other well. So let me just emphasize that point. Um, you know, a good theory or praxis, uh, I like this word praxis up here, and fearlessness at the same time. Let me get my drawing tool. So praxis really means well, found the right tool, why not here? Let's see, drawing, oh, it's that one, yeah. So praxis, is this, you know, sounds a complicated term, but I think it's a very important term uh, because it really relates to theory that we use to help make sense of the world, help make sense of fear in this case, or fear management education. It's theory plus practice and the idea here is that we utilize theory to help create a better sense of how to do practice effectively. And we use practice in the field, right? And that's our real experience day to day, um, feeds back in this loop. So that's really what the word praxis means. It's this loop and that practice, what we learn, uh, improves theory. Theory then can be redeveloped into you know more complex and that's what i'm going to show you today um, how i think in more complex theoretical frames every time you kind of come back around you do this practice and you know with practices an analysis of some sort right a critical analysis a self-reflection that goes on i'm saying these are all the things that i don't think michael moore does very well and or at all when it comes to how he promotes how to deal with fear and use fear so last point, just to remember, in his um, film, you know, 11.9, my, my critique was that uh, he argues for using terror here, and he's talking about the BT regime in America, especially. He argues for using terror, fear in uh, the new presidential regime in America to get us out on, on the line and, of course, vote and, of course, win. My argument to Michael Moore in this regard is that um that's all fear based uh, talk um the critiques i have which i'll get to um pretty shortly after i do this little reading of this essay uh, introduction that i mentioned i'll get to on the next whiteboard um, or the critiques that came because i argue you know a fear-based way isn't the greatest way to go and others have said no no there, there's good reasons for fear so just giving you a clue to uh, what the next uh, teaching on this whiteboard is going to be. All right, so I'm going to go to uh, somewhere I can erase this apparently. Yeah, clear. They're all drawings. Okay. So let me go to this uh, essay now. Philosophy of fear, listeners plus philosophy of theorism. And um, the main theorist for each of these is Fisher, and the leader of the philosophy of theorism is uh, Suba. And I won't repeat, uh, those have been on several of the uh, topics 
uh, videos that I've created and these two people, Desh Suba and his work. So I'm not going to repeat that. So in the essay, I start with, uh, there's a researcher, a historian, a really honorable researcher in American Academy right now. His name is uh, Stearns, Peter, Peter N. And he's a professor at uh, George Mason University. He's founder of Emotionology and a leading scholar on emotions history today. So there's a whole area called Emotionology. He and his wife partner uh, started way back uh, over 20 years ago. He never continued with that phrase, and now he's, uh, for various reasons, interesting enough, because uh, I kind of liken it as a forerunner for virology. And he stopped using that term within academia for probably all kinds of reasons, but he now uses uh, emotions history, and there's a huge scholarship you know, around that um, study right now, scholarship. Uh, many people, he's, he's one of the founders, of the early people who's done that work. So reading my essay, uh, Peter Stearns, professor of history, George Mason University, founder of Emotionology and a leading scholar on emotions history today, urged his international colleagues in a recent 2008 paper to, quote, Stearns says, a more systematic analysis, end of quote. And he wanted a coordinated research agenda on fear in societies. I loved finding this paper. Um, it was very supportive of the work that Desh Subha and I are doing. Undoubtedly, back to the essay, he and other scholars have concluded more or less that in modern times, fear is the predominant. Fear is, sorry, fear uh, has become a predominant emotion. And he notes that, you know, several scholars have said this. They believe that this is very true. And then he also points out in this 2008 paper that, um, you know, there's others that are find that not necessarily so true and there's a controversy. But he does say that whatever the case, um, fear is definitely the most important, if not the most powerful of the emotions uh, relating to our future. And he says, in that sense, the, the, the emotions history scholars um, are concerned about the future and fear. I, I call it rising levels. Um, and you might notice this rising levels is very similar to CO2 levels rising in the whole climate change uh, global warming debates. So I've used that analogy. I actually think it's a really reasonable uh, analogy to make. So uh, continuing back in the essay then, it is to this kind of global call from Stearns to a more critical, coordinated, and systematic analysis of, and here's uh, a nice piece, uh, phrase he uses, quote, fear as a social, variable and that social variable uh, really is cultural that could be political and that's historical all at the same time uh, we're talking about a really big influence uh, when we make fears a social variable and the contrast is uh, we could make fear as a psychological individual variable which is the most common uh, way of understanding, of defining fear, okay? So um, that's not what uh, my work is about in a philosophy of fearlessness, nor Desh Suba's work in a philosophy of fearism. And remember, we've combined these, uh, Desh and I, uh, back in 2014. So we're gonna to have to get beyond this, folks, is really the message I'm saying, and thank you, Peter Stearns, um, for saying that's exactly what we have to do. We have to get beyond and see fear as a social variable, and again, political, historical, economic, cultural um, variable.
So based on that, um, go back to the essay. So with the systematic analysis, he calls for fear as a social variable that I personally situate my own research and educational agenda. I wonder what kind of philosophy or philosophies are uniquely required to address the fear problem. And that really is, again, this kind of level of fear problem, uh, or a holistic and integral approach. My colleague from Nepal, living in Hong Kong, wrote, now we're going up to Des Suvas, in his book, uh, 2014, his classic work on philosophy of fearism, he wrote, is philosophy with fear even possible? And really what he meant is, is philosophy with fear as central? Uh, you know, the only way we have to go. And I think really that's what he's saying um, in his work. And I'm saying the same thing. Fear cannot just be a variable. It has to uh, come down to be really what this is what Desh is saying. And I'm arguing in this uh, paper that I'm just reading, fear is central. And, and that we're sort of arguing is, you know, actually empirical. And we're also saying theoretical. And that is part of our foundation for a, a philosophy. Okay, that's where we're going. So in order to study fear, continuing in the essay, in a new and better way, two researchers and writers on either side of the earth came to the, onto the scene in independent ways. Our Michael Fisher, a Canadian since 1989, named fearlessness as a philosophical and epistemological approach or lens to study fear. And Desh Suba from Nepal, since 1999, named fearism as a philosophical approach via his notion of a fearist lens. We met online in late 2014 and began to collaborate in an East-West synthesis. See our book, Fisher and Suba 2016. In that book, according to Peter Stearns, who wrote in, the, in one of the endorsements, thank you, Peter, cor quote, correctly, this book correctly identifies fear as a major contemporary problem and uses cross-cultural dialogue, not only to improve diagnosis, but also to propose some possible remediation. The focus is commendable. And just uh, as a, if you want to look up anything on Peter Stearns' work uh, recently, uh, his major book is worth looking up he, but he's really a, known as a specialist in american fear and i think that's part of his book title you can look up his work uh, continuing in the essay the most unique approach to the study of the global problem of fear beyond stern's now stern still even though he's calling for the systematic approach to fear contemporary fear problem uh, beyond Stern's disciplinary focus only on the history of fear and emotions, that's his specialty, another book came out in 2012 by Laffin and Wise. So get their names down here. Uh, Laffin and Wise in 2012. And that was on a uh, really a multi disciplinary uh, approach to studying fear and the history of fear. Quite a lovely book. I, I, I just don't have the title right in front of me, but um, I'll probably put it up in, on, on the description under the video so you can have a look there. Uh, it's the first book I've ever seen of drawing really multiple scholars from different disciplines to actually contemplate, like, how do we define fear um, and critically examine what are our methodologies and how we define fear and what have they been throughout history and in different disciplines and how to have a conversation. So uh, this is really a, a key book in my view. Um, I'll just emphasize it's a scholarly book, but it's, it's this that's so important, and as any of you know, um, philosophy of fearlessness, philosophy of fearism, um, as I've said in other places, is transdisciplinary uh, work. 
that's uh, how we think we're going to learn more about fear, uh, what I call fear with these marks. And again, in all of this has got to do with the most important word for today's talk, context and how we understand fear, how we talk about fear and how we come up with ideas. And this is what I'm challenging Michael Moore to get back to um, his not so good part of his education approach. All right, so I'll just finish the essay then. Um, this rare work of progressive postmodern scholarship on fear, LaFan and Wise, according to the editors themselves, um, fear is ubiquitous but slippery. All right, I, this is the quote I really like uh, that they open in their introduction. They say, fear is ubiquitous meaning it's everywhere, has been everywhere, but slippery. Thank you very much for saying that, uh, you two scholars, because uh, this is really where the whole problem of simplification of fear and seeing fear is somehow obvious and we know how to move forward and deal with it, as in Michael Moore's uh, declarations of using fear and terror to motivate ourselves. So finish the essay, uh, this opening. I couldn't agree more with these authors. And thus my focus in this monograph is on the track of contemporary emergent philosophies regarding fear that specifically gives serious credence to the problems with understanding this slippery nature of fear itself. I have no problem based on my three decades of study on this topic in asserting that human history is fundamentally a history of fear and how humans have tried to repress that truth, uh, sometimes engage it, and ultimately try to manage it. Not all historians would agree, but there are emotions historians like Stern that are coming to see that fear is not just one and on par with several emotions, but is a most powerful, and here's really the word that he uh, Stearns use, uses in his essay, key emotion. It's not just the same as all the other emotions, anger and sadness and so on. That's the argument of philosophy of fears and philosophy of fear, lessness. Beyond the historians, several scholars have concluded in various forms or vocabularies, this is based on my own research, that quote, Fear is a central, is central to mammalian evolution itself. And that's a quote from Arnie Ullman in 2008, another scholar who's written about the psychology of anxiety and fear and is a well-recognized scholar himself. All right, well, so much for that bit of essay. Um, thank you for bearing with me. Let's uh, clear the screen here. Now I'm gonna to get to my model of which I use as a basis for understanding and for critique. Uh, I'm not just gonna come out and try to be critical of Michael Moore or anybody's text or somebody that's teaching about fear and fear management education. I'm not gonna just come out because I disagree with them, I have an opinion about them uh, and their work. Um, that's one level of critique, but it's certainly not the level of critique I like to offer. And certainly as a fearologist, I feel uh, required and responsible to come up with more complex and more informative critiques than my own personal opinion. All right, um, so let's see, let's start with uh, the kind of problem where Michael and Morg and I and my critics, when I criticized Michael Moore in that film, um, Fahrenheit 11.9, uh, I had a few critics and some I respect a lot, um, said, oh, come on, you're being a little bit too hard on Michael Moore. You know, he, he's not such a bad guy. Well, I'd say he was a bad guy. Um, Michael Moore, you know, is he's offering some, you know, important stuff and you're being a little too hard on him. And I think what, why I wanted to do this video is, is I think people really just don't understand how I structure uh, my critiques uh, of the way Michael Moore was defending and reproducing the uh, discourse of 
let's use our fear and terror and get out on the line and vote and you know we'll move forward and this will be the new progressive revolution um, no i don't think so and that's what i make in that video and the reason is is because fear uh, if i just give it a sort of sphere here of um, the normal way we use fear normal way we understand fear and in the case with the film um, michael moore also uses the word terror equivalently and all i'm saying is well terror is you know a, a kind of an extreme extreme form of fear so i'm just kind of putting them in that sphere of and michael moore really is saying you know there's and that my critics are saying this too and they are very vocal about it and they write about it is look michael don't be so hard because look you know there's good fear there's bad fear right so uh, they want to say, you know, there's good fear and there's bad fear, and they make this, you know, very simple distinction um, to try and explain, you know, fear is not all bad, right? And I'm not ever said fear is all bad. However, that's a very problematic statement in my research, my transdisciplinary research on fear. So again, we're talking about the general topic here of motivation. Uh, and its justifications. Okay, that's really what my critique is. Um, of Michael Moore specifically, and I said he, that could be many people that uh, would have a similar discourse, a similar teaching to Michael Moore. So for political change, for psychological change, we can use fear, get to know fear. I know all that literature, okay? I've read and studied that for decades. Um, that's not uh, a good enough positioning and standpoint in my view and in my informed view. So here's what I do around the word fear uh, as it's normally used. And some people try to again distinguish good fear in there, bad fear in there, uh, as they try to understand the sphere of experience, the uh, sphere of knowledge that we have created around fear and terror. So it's really this next domain of an expansion, expanded, and I said again, the major word I'm teaching about today is, if you want to understand my work, is context. And the basic simple notion that I started with way back in my research was that, okay, fear is fear, and I can see people talking about it, but you know what, there's also a concept that is in the literature, and it's one I use a lot too. Uh, I'm not going to use capitals for this just for now, is a notion of fear based. So these have created two spheres now, as you can see. Uh, one is the smaller fear of this enclosure or this context of what we might call regular fear. Again, good fear, some people say that's a natural fear. And uh, this is excessive fear, right? When fear gets too excessive and so on. I'm fine with that to a point, this kind of psychological discourse and it's very common in psychiatry and psychology and it goes back to Aristotle uh, as a matter of fact in philosophy. And in some ways I think it's worth just saying, I find it, it's all very Aristotelian kind of talk. And yet, I, I've also, you know, got other people that I've colleagues who said this is also, you know, fundamental in indigenous, uh, indigenous, you know, uh, knowledge systems and understanding is that there's these two distinctions in fear. All right. Well, I won't go into those any further in detail, and that's a whole other lecture. But it's the second sphere, sphere, this expanded sphere now. That I'm talking about what does fear based mean and I've said this in other videos is I define fear based as when more than 50% of the motivation fifty percent plus of the motivation is fear based I can move that over a bit all right guess I can't move that all right <laughs> and that is a very different phenomenon because if someone is operating uh, on this fear-based uh, 
greater than 50% of their decisions and motivations are based on fear. Um, that's a context itself. In other words, that's sort of part of a personality structure. That's part of a character structure. And I go so far as to make the claim from a social, cultural, political point of view that that actually is our society is pretty much operating and has been. And I've said in other videos and other places and one could go into a long critique of that, 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 that uh, fear-based structure, 50% or more fear-based decision-making motivation, that, that's as much as 5,000 to 10,000 years old in human history. Another argument for another time, I have mentioned it in my writing. Let's get back to the next context now. Third context, the drawing tool. The third expanded context around the notion of fear, again, in this simple to fear-based, and this is the one I call, and this is complex to explain, I'm not going to be able to try and do it here, is what I'll even call fear-based. So I put these uh, marks on fear. Uh, I did that a long time ago to show that we have to actually deconstruct because of this problem of such a great amount of our motivation being 50% or plus fear-based on an ongoing basis. And that's part of personality, part of character, part of society itself. Um, I argue that there's been a sort of a new morph created and I call it fear um, that we have to pay attention to and it's a deconstruction of this you know ordinary fear that we sort of accept the definitions without a lot of problematizing and it's again because of this expanded context to there expanded context to there we now have this concept uh, of fear and I think that this this is shaping well, my argument is, is that this fear that's constantly morphing and shifting, it's some, I sometimes call it culturally modified fear. I've shared in other videos. Um, let's write that down just so you remember what I'm speaking about here is culturally modified is fight fear becomes fear. That's one way I talk about it. Again, this is a really complex topic of why I use fear. But it does create a whole other dynamic to the engagement, to the development of these relations between fear, between fear-based, between fear itself in this construction uh, that goes on. And so then let's go to the last one, much larger expansion that leads from now that third one into the fourth one, context. That's what we're dealing with here, dealing with motivations. The fourth uh, context uh, I'll often write as, I have many different terms I've used, there's a fear project going on. I also sometimes call that fear projection. There's a, what I've called using Ken Wilber's work, a Phobos, Anatos matrix, and simply I'll call that sometimes a fear matrix. Well, these are, again, you can see is a, a larger sphere of what's going on. And um, I agree, you know, some of this is a little bit more on the metaphysical side of things. Um, and arguments I can make, I've written lots about these topics. Again, won't go into that in this video, but to say that very, very, powerful forces and dynamics that most of us are absolutely unconscious of, unless you're really studying this. Just like most of us are pretty unconscious of this 50% or more fear-based motivation, because it's kind of invisible, it's hard to see it. And after a while, of course, it, it's part of the society, as I said over here, and it becomes you know, normalized here. Uh, levels, patterns. To the point where we, we don't really hardly even recognize what the heck it is uh, that's going on. Okay. 
uh, so this fourth level is really the largest context that I have created. And what I want to kind of end this video on is to show that what I'm talking about here is, get my text marker. I'm talking about fear, a view, right? A perspective that I've taken as building this four levels of critique. Um, it's really fear management system that has evolved, I call it number seven. Um, sometimes called fearlessness. Let's see if I can get that to come up. There we go. The whole picture that I've just given you right now, the structuration of critique, uh, is what I call fear management seven. Uh, out of about 10 fear management systems in the evolution of humankind that one could generalize about. That's again, my larger critical integral theory of uh, fear systems or fear management systems. And the other uh, part that goes with fear management seven, just to give you a sense of it is uh, plus, I also use what I call a fearless stand, let me stretch that out. Fearless standpoint and theory. And that's fear management system nine, uh, which I argue in my theory is the highest level of perspective that one can look at sort of the whole evolution of fear systems and how humans have tried to figure out again how to understand, how to you know, experience in different ways and understand. Uh, create knowledge of, create methodologies for um, a better fear management approach. So in a nutshell, that's uh, how Michael Moore, for example, and I are not talking about the same thing when, or his crit people are critical of me when they say, no, there's good fear, there's you know bad fear, and Michael Moore is talking about good fear that and I say, yeah, that's very Aristotelian thinking. And uh, I'm very critical of that. And even the indigenous perspective, I am also somewhat critical of if it does not, and typically usually does not, even the, the great wisdom in the indigenous perspectives that I'm seeing and the people I talk to, is they do not uh, look at these four levels, right? These four contextual levels for fear is not just the same as it used to be in the good old days. It's good fear, bad fear, and as, you know, as if this is some kind of stable entity of distinction that holds for all time in history. Well, yeah, Aristotle thought that would be great. And I think uh, people from the old ways, and indigenous ways, you know, they'd come up with this because it was very pragmatic. And I'm saying, well, sorry, we, we do live in a very much more complex situation today with accumulated fear, rising fear levels, as I said on the previous slide. And we have to look at these expanding contexts. So number two, uh, what happens to fear? What happens to fear when it's actually in a fear-based personality, character structure, society? And what happens to fear when it is continually in this third sphere being constructed, culturally modified, and manipulated as this. And also to remember with this fear marks on fear, uh, that puts a big question mark on. And that's what I call the deconstruction reconstruction work that I do in my trying to understand fear better. And uh, so it's not just, again, all bad, bad, toxic. Yes, there's a lot of toxicity going on uh, when you get up here into these, the third dimension. Even in that second dimension, there's a lot of toxicity starting to build accumulated fear, accumulated trauma that goes with that fear, unhealed, painful memories. But I want you to keep in mind that when I use fear with the marks on in that third sphere or context, um, I'm really talking about something that I say, we, we may not know fear as much as we think we do. Okay, well, just the moment I say that, you can just hear if we go back to sphere one up here, right? That's not how Michael Moore is thinking about fear and how he talks about fear. And there's none of that kind of praxis. There's none of that kind of theoretical practice feed of criticality going into his thinking. Um, 
And so he just wants to use a simple, you know, first context, which again, many people do. It's convenient. Good fear, bad fear. Good fear is good for motivating. Bad fear is bad for motivating. Creates bad results. Um, well, you can see that by the time you're at the third level, it just, I just can't go there because there's too many questions uh, to ask about, well, how are you defining fear, Michael Moore? And others, uh, how are you assuming uh, normalized fear and other levels and patterns of normalized fear that have happened that have created this fear-based second contextual level to actually shifting? So these contexts, as they expand, they expand the very identity, definition, meaning, uh, methodologies that are going to be needed to better understand fear. It's no longer just that simple. And then by the time we get to the fourth, this great expansive one that uh, is very important in my work. Uh, most people don't appreciate uh, why I've constructed the that fourth. They can kind of sort of handle that, okay, first, second, third, but once, once I get down into creating this fourth, um, context uh, yeah most people are not going to go there it's a uh, uh, seemingly basically just too complex uh, it's too expansive and feels overwhelming and there's some truth to that <laughs> um, however as you notice that the fundamental philosophy that i teach to come to utilize that kind of critical critical contextual mapping and method, philosophy of fear is, fearism from Suba and philosophy of fearlessness to me are the two really most, I think, most unique emergent tools today in the 21st century to be able to handle and embrace in a really productive and healthy way. That's, that's the thesis that uh, just Suba and I are working on. And you can see I even use the word fearlessness as focus. And I'm working right now on a, not just a philosophy of fearlessness, but a fearlessness philosophy to better articulate how we can better embrace all of those complexities of contexts, multiple meta contexts. All right, well, that was a long explanation. Um, I don't want to apologize for it, but I do understand it's, it's not always the uh, easiest to get the first time so maybe if you want to watch this video a few times if you want to chat with me you want to follow some of the links on the video description here um, perhaps this will start to make some more sense to you and we can have some conversations about it etc okay thanks very much for this day